How many of you are sysadmins here? How many of you use KVM? Sorry? OpenVC. OpenVC is containers, right? What's that? Okay. In one line, it's like what VMware does in one million lines of code, KVM does it in one um, ten thousand lines of code. What's that? Yeah, um, it's not like theoretical words I'm saying. There is this um, thing called spec word. Um, th that's not VRAM, it's, it's a third party which runs. Okay, let's start with um, Anyway, um, my name is Kashyap Chamathi. I work for Red Hat, specifically in Red Hat's um, identity and security engineering group. Um, I also deploy and test a lot of KVM as part of uh, my test infrastructure and also general upstream you know, interest. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about KVM based virtualization, um, how hardware virtualization came in. And uh, a little bit about management tools like LibWire and disk image modification tools where you can edit, modify, inspect virtual machine disk images in case if they're screwed up and you want to rescue them. Um, you can use this cool thing called LibGuestFS. And then we'll do a little bit of a small demo. And then if you have time for questions, we'll take it. That's the agenda we just spoke about. KVM virtualization. Um, am I audible to the uh, last person there? So Intel and AMD started. Uh, what's that? Okay, I keep track. So Intel and AMD started providing. You want me to drag it ahead? I think it should be okay. That's why they kept it there. So okay, Intel and AMD started providing hardware extensions, hardware virtualization extensions around 2005 or so. Um, so what exactly these hardware extensions provide? They enable a new mode, new operating mode called guest mode in the CPU so that virtual machine instructions can run natively on the physical machine. Not all of them, only uh, mainly CPU based instructions. What instructions doesn't run on physical? machine from the guest OS, we'll talk about that. So KVM is essentially a kernel module, it was introduced around 2006 or so, it's a loadable kernel module and this Israeli engineer called Ravi Kiviri, he posted the first patch and it was introduced into Linux kernel 2620, I guess. So it's a simple, kernel, not simple, it's a kernel module, um, so you could see three of them there, one is a generic um, kernel module and Two are the vendor specific kernel modules, Intel and AMD. Intel calls its uh, virtualization as VMX um, and AMD calls it SVM. VMX stands for Virtual Machine Extensions. AMD SVM is Secure Virtual Machine. It's just similar implementation with just a different name. One of the neat things with KVM is it, it, it turns the Linux kernel into, in, into, a, into a hypervisor. Hypervisor is just a fancy term for the ability to run multiple virtual machines. It's also called as Virtual Machine Monitor, VMM, that's how it's referred internally by Intel manuals and stuff. So it, ex it essentially exports a character device called slash dev slash KVM so that user space could create virtual machines and allocate memory to virtual machines using this character device. So the neat thing with KVM, and it's, it's a powerful thing with KVM is it reuses existing Linux kernel infrastructure. What does it mean? It doesn't reinvent wheel by ha any hypervisor needs standard things like CPU scheduling, memory management, timer handling, NUMA, um, device drivers, all these things. Instead of re-implementing all of these things with a special kernel for the guest, KVM reuses Linux kernel infrastructure. So kernel has excellent support for all these things. So why do you have to reinvent the wheel? So that KVM developers can concentrate on the core part of the problem which is virtualization itself. So naturally, KVM's design and development is driven by 
hardware specifications so that whatever Intel and AMD bring in innovations, there's VTX, X is for CPU, CPU virtualization, VTC is for connectivity and network, there's IO virtualization as well, it's done by PCI group. So these are several things um, in progress. Anyway, um, this is a high level overview and architecture of uh, KVM. At the bottom of the stack, um, is everybody able to see that? that? There's nothing much there anyway. The bottom of the stack is x86 uh, hardware which supports virtualization extensions, either Intel or AMD. And then there is Linux kernel which runs KVM, which puts the CPU into the guest mode whenever you want to run instructions natively on the physical machine. And QMU. QMU is an interesting uh, piece of software. So KVM itself cannot do everything. KVM does CPU virtualization. So it runs CPU intensive um, workloads directly on the physical machine. But to run a complete virtual guest, we need a lot of, we need a complete PC-like environment, right? We need IO devices like VGA cards, um, network cards, sound cards, ID disks, mouse, all these things. Where do you get all these things from? So all these things are emulated by QMU. QMU stands for Quick Emulator. So it's the IO emulation device, um, sorry, software. It does all the IO emulation. So why do I um, note regular applications there, like Firefox and other stuff? Each virtual machine, as in each, each virtual machine runs as a QMU instance. So each QMU instance is a regular Linux process. What does this mean? It means we could use standard Linux process infrastructure tools like PS, Kill, you know, Top to monitor virtual machines. So that's the reason I just listed regular applications. So it's, it's pretty powerful that way. That's just briefly about KVM. Can you be a bit more louder, sorry? Okay, the question was, are the applications running as process or the virtual machine running as process? Virtual machines are also like regular Linux processes. So virtual machine is a process, application is also a process. Modify the RAM for what, sorry? For the virtual machine? Uh, if it is running as a process, okay, initially by creating the VM, we are going to force your presence, okay? So, what do you have RAM for the virtual machine? Yeah. Okay. So, let's start with the process. Yeah, you can do hot memory adding and, you know, stuff like that. You could add memory and you not know, reduce memory. There is work for that. This is, comes under Luma and stuff. So I can show it to you live once the session is done. And this is a couple of um, management tools. Libword is essentially a hypervisor agnostic uh, uh, management library. What does it mean? Uh, it, it supports several hypervisors like KVM, Zen, etc. So that you don't have to learn hypervisor specific commands to manage virtual machines. This is just a high level view of uh, libguestfs, libword and virtuals. What is libguestfs? Um, I have a detailed slide for that. In, in short, um, what libguestfs does is it will let you modify, edit, inspect virtual machine disk images. Let's say if they're broken, you could rescue them by, you know, uh, if, if the machine is um, screwed beyond repair, you could just um, boot that disk image and copy out the content so that you don't lose all the data. So it's just a slightly different view from what we saw in a different picture earlier. So LibWord um, interacts with QMU. Um, we could invoke virtual machines with QMU command line. I don't know who, uh, anyone has seen QMU KVM command line machine. You could imagine it's like several lines of. Uh, I could show it to you when, when, when we're doing demo. It's like several lines of um, uh, parameters and you know directives to pass to it. So it's difficult to keep track of it, and it's not usually recommended to run QMU KVM um, itself. So LibWord takes all the best practices and provides you the best command line. 
So libword interacts with QMU, and there are a bunch of tools written on top of libword. Word install is a command line um, installation um, software. It, it comes with the package Python word inst. And then there is a WordSH. Wush is the shell, virtualization shell interface for libword so that you could do all the general lifecycle management. And uh, there are a couple of more <coughs> graphical interfaces as well. How many of you heard of Word Manager? So, okay. Um, don't, uh, okay, I won't say that at the moment. Word Manager is, is, is one of the most common things which people are aware of. And Boxes is, it's, it's called Gnome Boxes. It's integrated into Gnome Shell directly. So it's, it's for um, desktop virtualization. It's one of the neat projects which is, which is being worked on. And um, libguest uh, Lib guest FS provides a shell tool called guestfish to interact with disk images. Just a bit more detail about libguest. Um, libguest is uh, it uses a client server model, so uh, you could connect to a remote libguest D daemon from your client machine so that you could access and uh, do all general lifecycle virtual machine lifecycle operations. And it also uses an XML format to define virtual machine guests. So everything is an attribute and an element, um, right from CPUs to vCPUs, your memory, disks, devices, all devices, IO devices, everything is implemented as an XML element. So there's a neat tool to uh, access this XML files and edit as well. And like I mentioned, um, WordSH is the shell interface which um, LibWord provides. And this just a bunch of things which I noted here that it could do several things. This is just a laundry list of some of the things it could do to manage virtual machines. You could manage devices, network, network uh, interfaces. You could hot add network interfaces and hot unplug, hot add, and snapshot. Snapshots is an interesting thing which I really like to do um, because in, a, in, a, in development or test environment, you should have a known state where you want to revert to. So this gives you a. Uh, can you can you provide on the EM processes about how much I/O bandwidth or how much network bandwidth is going to be? Do you use that in something else, or is it possible that I can limit bandwidth on the EM? Yeah, exactly. Um, he's talking about clipping bandwidth, and you know, capping the amount of uh, bandwidth virtual machines can be assigned to. There's this complex technology called C groups. Um, which will do that. You could do, you know, you could cap network bandwidth and stuff like that. You could assign and allocate resources. So yes, you could do that. You think this is these are disk actually snapshots? There are different flavors of snapshots. Okay, um, there are internal disk snapshots, as in. Um, Snap, the original snapshot and its delta, everything is stored in a single file. And there are external snapshots where the original file is the single original image in a single file, and all the deltas are different files. And then you have VM state snapshots, which captures the uh, memory state of a particular virtual machine. So there are different flavors of snapshots. Yes, If you do, um, if you do memory um, save VM, there's this VM snapshots which do uh, memory checkpoint snapshots. I'm sorry, which which, which takes the snapshot of mem uh, memory of a virtual machine so that you know, it saves it into a file. So whatever application we're running, when you revert and invoke it, they're just back. They're just back and you know, back to the same state with which they were invoked. Um, Libguest FS. This is this this is a bit of network tuning. We could get get back to it once you know once we do the demo. It requires a bit of detailed discussion, so yeah, we can do that. So we don't deviate from what we have in hand. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, so libguestfs is also a library, an API. It provides a shell interface like guestfish, so that you could um, script your changes 
um, to virtual machine disk images. So you get one practical example is um, recently one of the virtual machines I was using got screwed up due to SC Linux, and um, I I'd, I'd like to try to boot that virtual machine by placing um, SC Linux into permissive mode. How do I do that? But the machine but the virtual machine doesn't boot. So enter guest guest fish. So this boots the disk image when the virtual machine is on. I'm off, sorry. You should not run guest fish when the virtual machine is live and running. It could cut up the data inside it. So it, you invoke guest fish on a disk image, which is off, and then I logged into it, edit the SLNX config file from this and then booted it. So this is just one of the practical aspects. There are also several word tools based on libguestfs, which are essentially wrappers around uh, libguestfs API so that they are easy to access and uh, uh, use the tools. So that's just briefly about uh, libguestfs. It's, it's, it lets you essentially do a lot more with disk images. I just noted a few of the things which uh, with it could do. Resizing images, you, know, you, could rescue, you could even create a disk image from scratch with that. Okay, let's quickly see a um, demonstration. Okay, I think I should. Is it visible? <coughs> so virtual machine creation, there are several different ways to create virtual machines. Um, one of the common ways which I use are uh, word install and OZ. This lets you create virtual machines unattended so that you don't have to provide any manual input to the virtual machine. And you can just fire it and forget and virtual machine will be back up. Let's just quickly walk through um, how it does. It creates a virtual machine in four minutes or so. Um, a minimal virtual machine, which involves all the core packages, so that you know you have all the necessary tools and infrastructure, so that build the VM to whatever you want to make it as mail server or an identity server, whatever it would be. Is the text uh, visible to the last? <laughs> So there are two different types of form, disk image formats. One is a RAW and the other is QCOV2. QCOV2 stands for QMU Copy and Write. It's a versatile format. Um, RAW is, uh, let's talk about RAW first. RAW gives you ability, um, it gives you a robust, uh, and it, it's robust kind of, and also it's robust against power failures and it's kind of fast compared to QCOV2. So usually production disk images, they tend to go RAW. And QCOV2, QCOV2 has improved a lot. These days, I use QCOV2 for most of my infrastructure, uh, but you have to do a little bit of tweaking to get the disk image uh, to perform as well as RAW. So it's not a big of a deal. So QCOV2 provides you the snapshots, the disk image snapshots. They're, they're possible with QCOV2 disk images. So let's just quickly look into this um, shell script which I wrote. Um, is this text visible? Cool. Um, it's just checking if there's a bridge or not. Let's go to the meat of the part which does the installation actual part. Okay, this is the tool. I'm invoking it this way. And it connects to QMU. Um, QMU is the initializer, like I mentioned. KVM cannot initialize everything. So QMU initializes all the I.O. devices. So we are connecting to the QMU uh, hypervisor there. QMU system. System is the root access so that you get all the elevated privileges. And network. I'm just using a standard bridge. It, Lippert provides a standard bridge interface called verb BR0. It gives you natting. So I'm just using the standard bridge. And I'm using a minimal kickstart file. So let's quickly look into this kickstart. How many of you are familiar with kickstart files? Good. This is the minimal kickstart file. That's it. The kickstart file ends here. So just a bunch of random things. Root password, just use the same one. Um, packages. 
core, only at core packages. You could see that. So it will install the minimal um, virtual machine. Let's go back to our this thing. Okay, this is missing some kernel locks. Yeah. Okay, uh, anyway, let's go through this. So here you could provide kernel arguments like, um, where were we? Okay, we were here. We provide a minimal kickstart file, and then you provide extra args, as in you provide serial console. Let's say you don't have network inside your virtual machine. How do you access the virtual machine? So this provides you a serial console so that you can connect to the virtual machine and you know do some kind of rescue operation or you know bring up the network and you provide the name which is self-explanatory and disk path um, I just gave the variable upstairs and then the format which we use to go to cache is none that's a, that's a performance optimization parameter so that your disk images are optimized for you know better performance. No, no, whatever you, whatever operations are happening with the virtual machine, they're all written to the disk directly. Yeah, 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 they're all written to the disk directly. So there is cache equal to write through, write back, and etc. We can discuss about that. And it does check the CPUs, as in the virtual CPUs which you're providing are not more than the available physical CPUs. And we have CPU set which will do NUMA. Uh, how many are aware of the NUMA? So, uh, so NUMA is just, uh, uh, it's not just, it's non-uniform memory access. It's, uh, you know, we could allocate CPUs to physical, CP, uh, virtual CPUs to physical ones and also, you know, memory access. CPUs can access memory which are local to their node and, you know, some stuff like that you could do with this. So when you provide auto, you don't have to do all the tuning stuff. This would select the default and you know um, whatever is sane on your machine it will just auto select that one and accelerate is it will use kvm acceleration this is actually by default these two flags are now taken by default so you don't have to provide that and then location i can provide path to a tree of uh, installation or yeah it, it usually takes a tree or you could use also provide iso but usually with, with tree it does slightly faster of course, it's all on LAN, assuming. And OS type Linux and OS variant Fedora 16. So these two will optimize the guest further for better performance, like it will pick what IO. What IO is the IO framework for KVM based virtual machines. And there is no graphics. So that virtual machines, I can boot them directly on the shell and it won't give me a graphical interface so I don't have to deal with X. So, yeah, this, this I'm sorry, where is the question? Is KVM available on KVM is developed on... Uh, it's available. Is a, oh yeah, it's available. It's available on all... It's available on all Linux distros. It's there by default. It's shipped by default. It's integrated into Linux kernel, right? So it's, uh, whatever you're installing the packages, they're the uh, user level uh, management software, the Libvirtus management software. Um, so it's, it's on by default. If you have Linux kernel and you are Assuming your uh, CPU supports virtual extensions, how do you check that? Let's check if our CPU supports uh, virtual machine extensions. Let's grep for VMX and SVM or AMD. You know? We're grep grepping for Intel extens extensions or AMD extensions. Slash proc CPU info. Um, if you get some kind of output, you do have it. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I have a couple of, um, I have four to five processors on this, so that's why for each processor it is listing so much of output. On a regular clean interface, you'd see it much better. So it's in there somewhere, definitely. If you get any kind of output, yes, it does support. Ah. So, and also, if, let's see if our machine is properly configured so that LibWord can manage the guests. So let's run sudo what host. Validate. So it checks for hardware virtualization available, device KVM slash dev KVM available. It checks for a couple of virtualization, virt, uh, virtual network devices, device files available, and it checks for Linux containers as well. This is a whole check. Libvirt, like I said, you could manage plenty of hypervisors, right? You could also manage Linux containers as well. So it is also checking for Linux containers. So if you want to check specifically for QMU, so we could just do that. 
So it just show you the QMU um, So let's just see what does the uh, installation look like uh, on the STD out on the shell. This is the standard installation on the shell. Okay, we are not opening up a graphical interface. Everything is done on the shell. Um, so it just picks the Linux kernel and init the image, etc., etc. This is this is all the output which you get when you provide a serial console on the extra arcs for the kernel. We would see what is that, etc., etc. So you could see package installation like that on the shell. <clears throat> so you don't have to invoke X whatsoever. So these are the extra arguments, kernel arguments, which will provide us a serial console. OC is again another um, of, uh, tool with which you could create virtual machines automatically with as minimal input as possible from user. You could also automate this right away. With this, you could install virtual machines even with ISO. Let's say you don't have access to a tree. Everyone doesn't have access to OS trees on their machines, right? So if you want to do it from an ISO, you could do it with OZ. Just quickly, let's see um, what it takes. This is again just a sanity check for the script. Let's go to the meat of the part. Formatting is really screwed up. At least, it, yeah, less would do better for it. Okay, it will take a TDL file. I don't know if it's visible. Uh, it's called a template definition file, which, which it takes. You provide the name, again, version, standard options. I provide the ISO file path and root password and etc. stuff. So it just takes everything from this file and then it will invoke. I'm just making the TDL as needed. Using standard redirection, I'm just catting it to a file, TDL file. And then it invokes the OSI install command and you know outputs the std out to some text files. Have you noticed any advantages versus current? Have you noticed any advantages versus versus? I'm sorry, I'm OSI versus what is called a different difference. Differences? It's just an alternative way. With what is all you can't always do unattended with ISO. So OSI could do it with ISO. So this is being used, OSI is being used as a, a core part in uh, several cloud projects like EOLUS project, OpenStack, you know, all these things to use. Um, no, sorry, not OpenStack, EOLUS uses it, EOLUS. You could do, um, check much about EOLUS and EOLUS project or not, it's cloud project again. So let's just see some quick virtual machine operations with OSH. Um, This will list all the virtual machines which are available on the machine. So all these machines are turned off. Let's try to turn on one of the machines. OSH start S16 T1 dash dash console. So that we could see all the booting on the shell. The console will give you access to the serial console. Let's say you could select the kernel there. You could see all the boot, boot messages. Loads the initial RAM disk. Done. Okay, you got the root access for the shell. Um, okay, let's go down. There we go. So we are logging in without SSH or some stuff. So if let's say if the network is not there inside the virtual machine, this is a very handy and useful way to see the boot messages and login. To the virtual machine again this is the virtual machine okay the host is called tesla but the virtual machine is called stream so you can just see the difference so you won't get lost and let's say exit and how do we get out of this control that's it. what does that require i'm sorry yeah it's running uh, okay <laughs> list 
okay this will give give us what is the virtual machine what are the virtual machine which are running currently sorry yes ps ah okay cool yeah, that's I'm, I'm about to show that as well ps dash ef or let's do okay ps but that's a good question it's a really good question qmu like i said qmu works very well with kvm so we're just grabbing for qmu kvm this also gives us the huge command line which it uses so just as an example i was talking about nobody you know at least a human cannot remember that much of a command line so libvirt makes it easy for us so that it picks up the best defaults and gives us the you know best possible performance sorry say that again how much cpu does it consume when it is not running any virtual machine i mean if your vm is not running anything inside the uh, vm if you're not running any workload it shouldn't consume anything much you know apart from just the regular uh, linux pro the vm process which 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 it, which it needs to keep the machine up and running um, yeah sure yeah but when when you're not familiar with it you know on a day to day basis of course we have all this kind of um, questions so done i just um, noted down in small cells so that I, i remember what i'm trying to do Okay, let's do a snapshot. Uh, where is such list dash dash um, snapshot? But let's list if this machine has any snapshots. So I'm listing uh, the snapshots for the VM as 16T1. It doesn't have anything. Um, again, you could do live snapshots as well. Um, but let's do an offline snapshot by turning off the guest. Like I said, um, there are several different types of snapshots. internal snapshots wherein the snapshot and the master file everything is stored on one single file disk image word install yeah i did provide we see there's a flag called vcpu dash dash vcpu you can provide the, uh, and ram there's a flag called ram of course there's a, there the basic parameters right to get the machine up and running okay yeah, that, uh, yeah that's a slightly advanced question again you could see that but again you need to have numa and all kind of binding available on that machine there is no um, there is no uh, cpu pinning for that virtual machine at the moment it's just a simple machine i created for this test purpose uh, let's shut down this machine quickly doesn't take much time what is that something why you need to work sir sir I could do that. What I said, shut down as well. I just used it so that you could see the uh, shut down console messages on the shell. You could just do what I said, shut down VM as well. Um, this is the snapshot. Uh, simple uh, syntax for that. So I just shut down the guest. Usually you could run the script right away. So snapshot create as for domain. F17. It's just another virtual machine I gave. We could replace it with any of the virtual machines we have. Snapshot two is the snapshot two. Name of the snapshot. The other is the description of the snapshot. So let's do the same. F16. T1. That's our virtual machine, right? We were, we were handling that one. So let's call it snap uh, one. Snap for root one. to blink for 10 times or so just because it's writing all the snapshot data inside the single queue curve to disk image it's taking a little bit of time if you're using external snapshots it will be instantaneous because everything is written on a, on a different file 
Stop. Copy on the right. Right. This is a disk snapshot, and you could do VM snapshot by doing sudo where is it save VM or save virtual machine name. So it will save the virtual machine memory state into a single file. So snapshot is created. Let's see um, that I'm not faking it all by listing the snapshot. List. What's the virtual machine? 16D1. There we go. So we, uh, we could just have a tree of snapshots. I have another machine which has a couple of well said snapshot list. I have a rel6 uh, machine as well. Uh, it, it has three snapshots. Right. So you could also do a you could also check the, the relationship between snapshots by just doing a tree. So it gives you a tree view of snapshots available in a you know, neat way. What else have we got? Um, so you could also trivially apply the snapshot by doing, saying bush revert snapshot name, sorry virtual machine name and then do snapshot name. Oh yeah, you could do perf, all kind of things. This perf recently integrated into. That's right. Um, so yeah, you could also hot add devices, like I said, you could attach a, a network interface. Let's say you want to have a second network interface inside the virtual machine. Um, so how do you do that? While the virtual machine is running, you could just really do like that. So what is it? Attach, attach interface, we are attaching a network interface, domain, the virtual, um, in libvirt parlance, Node is the physical machine, domain is the virtual machine. So if you're confused by what is this domain thing, domain is just an alternative name for a virtual machine which Libbert uh, uses it. And type bridge, I'm using a source, what source, as in what is the bridge which we're using. So we're using a standard bridge, VIR, BR0, and model is Vertio, Vertio is an IO framework, and the MAC address, random MAC address which we're providing. So we could just do that for this virtual machine. Sudo dot slash five attach. So let's do it for a running virtual machine which we have right now. Where as such attach interface domain f sixteen t one type bridge source we are zero. Zero. Model. Old IO. Nah. Let me just change this symbol. Six. D. Okay. Ah, this is, we are trying to do a um, live, uh, hot at the virtual machine, right? but the virtual machine is. We are trying to hot at the. Uh, network interface, but the machine is not running, so let's just turn it on. Start F16 T1. You could see what it's doing. Instead of Still coding up. So, yep. It already has two interfaces, ETH1 and ETH0. Let's try to add another one. I 
had it successfully. So it, it is giving the uh, root message as, as well. It's using word IO PCI, it's the IO framework. So let's just see if it's really added or it's just acting up. Uh, if config, it two. There we go. So we got three interfaces as well. So yeah. You could also detach the interface very trivially just by doing detach, etc. So it's just self explanatory. Let's see a couple of quick examples for guest fish. Um, like I said, uh, guest fish could uh, let you look inside virtual machines and you know do operations without having a need to boot the virtual machine, right? Again, it's dangerous to run virtual uh, guest fish while the virtual machine is running. Research list. Down. Okay, like you asked. Let's push that down. Again, let's see what it's doing. Stopping all the services. Ta-da, done. Why is it less? No, it's not, not running. So let's do guest fish. Um, let's do it as root. Guest fish dash dash ro uh, read write. You could do read write because the machine is off. We can do read write operations. F16 D1 dash D is domain dash I is inspect. So So what it's doing? How do you uh, how do you think it's 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 boot it's it's giving us a file system shell to a virtual machine when it's not running? It's cheating us a little bit. So it's QM, uh, guest fish behind the scenes. It is running a small QMU KVM appliance to boot the virtual machine instantaneously. So we we could see that in in the debug messages. So we got the shell file system shell of um, F16 T1 right. So. You could see that etc system network <coughs> nothing that or uh, ST Linux. So yeah, you could turn ST Linux from <coughs> I'm just editing is it visible it's to bottom? Uh, yeah maybe I'll do it upstairs right so. it's a bad idea to do it on the bottom shelf anyway. Just fish dash dash read write domain f16 t1 dash i. Yeah, so it says operating system Fedora 16. It mounted the file system on slash on slash code. So vi slash etc sysconfig network. Uh, no SC Linux. Let's turn this into enforcing. It's never a good idea to put it in permissive. Um, so it's recommended to run enforcing all the time. Let's see if it reflects. It does. Exit. So yeah, the machine is not running. We could also see this by looking at one of the word tools, which is a wrapper around it. We don't have to fire the guest fish shell all the time. So we could do work cat dash d domain f16 t1 and which file we want to look inside of this virtual machine. So let we want to look at etc sysconfig network. Again behind the scenes it is invoking a small QMU KVM appliance. Oh, oh yes, we should see SC Linux. There we go. So just let's quickly uh, view the debug mode or what it's doing. Right? What it's doing behind the scenes. 
you could see it's working a small virtual machine actually you could not see let's scroll up a little bit it's showing all the files which is trying to monitor it where are we yeah look at that it is invoking a small qmu kvm appliance you know um, it, the disk image here's the disk image which we f16 q curve to etc 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 so it's 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 invoking essentially a small qmu kvm appliance to uh, boot the disk image and give us the file system access so yeah there are plenty of things which you could do we could inspect all the applications which are uh, inside a virtual machine and you know you could edit the virtual machine's file name using its Python bindings. Just a quick Python example. You know, how do you add a, a uh, the one which we did just now, editing SLNX config file. You could do it using a script, a Python script. Just a trivial one. You just import all the standard system modules. You import the guest fish module. We create a guest of us handle. We add the disk image. We launch. What is it launching? It's launching the QMU KVM sub process there, and then we're tracing. It will just list out all the commands of QMU KVM, and it mounts the file system. Just a bit of replacement logic. Yep, and it uploads the file and unmount. What is it doing? To replace hostname in a file, so automatically it can do it for you. So yeah, there are plenty of examples with which uh, we could play around all day. So I think. That sums up the demonstration. So there's a bit of uh, exciting features coming up. There's live snapshots, live migration. There's a storage improvements called Vodaya SCSI. Earlier there was a limitation of having, um, adding only 20 or 28 PCI devices. So you, that limitation is now removed with Vodaya SCSI and uh, PCI device enhancements, device assignment enhancements, and you know, nested virtualization, etc., etc. Et Nested virtualization is an interesting thing. Um, it's, it's essentially a virtual machine inside a virtual machine. So you have layers, it's like inception. Um, so one might think, what's the need of it? Let's say you, uh, you, you're trying to get a virtual, you, you have software and you want to test it on three different distributions. Uh, so uh, you go to a cloud vendor like Amazon or something, you get three different virtual machines. Instead of that, you can get a big bulky virtual machine and then you create virtual machines inside that. It's not all very smooth and stuff. It's kind of highly experimental, but I got it working and a couple of others also got it working. So essentially the use case is floating around uh, around that type. You know, you could get a big bulky virtual machine and you can create different virtual machines inside that so that you don't have to, you know, get several virtual machines from the cloud vendor. And there are several other features which I just haven't listed. Some resources. Uh, <coughs> If you want to reach me, that's the email address. I'm blocked at that place. Okay, any questions? And all these slides uh, I've uploaded on my Fedora People page. So all of it is, will be listed on the rootconf, um, you know, page. So you could just go there and check out the demonstration and all the notes and stuff. Okay, any questions? I'd be happy to take. Performance monitoring tool. This perf KVM. So there are a bunch of tools which people use. So Perf KVM is still in the process. There's a PMU, Performance Monitoring Unit, which is still being worked on. So there are a bunch of tools to do monitoring and stuff. When the instance is running, can you hot add memory? Yes, you could do that. Yeah, it is. It is essentially a wrapper around, not wrapper. I mean, actually, I'm not too familiar with the internal details. It deals. It deals with Perf KVM as well. So, PMU is um, a solution for performance monitoring guest message um, guest machines. I'm sorry. Yeah, you could hot add memory. That's one of the features which is uh, being recently introduced. Any other questions? Yeah, 
yeah um, the question was the vi command which i used uh, inside the guest fish um, how did i use it so it's guest fish will allow you to use a couple of not couple I mean, a bunch of command like 100 to 400 commands useful commands which are uh, you know required to rescue machines so vi is part of uh, guest fish so yeah i ran it inside the uh, Guest machine. But it's a separate OS system, right? It's not the OS. It's, it's, it's not OS. It's, it runs a minimum appliance. So it just put it in what four seconds or so. So how is it doing? It uses a small kernel and it it image. Yeah, it uses uh, the host uh, binaries and copies them into a different location. You know, it does all the time. It uses a small appliance called super min appliance. So you can read about the architecture and all on the website which I just listed. Uh, Libgestems.org. You, you have uh, quite a few, you know. Richard Jones, who is the primary developer, he knows Busybox. Um, could say, but it is, it is much more, you know, um, sophisticated. You could script things and so on. Busybox is a rescue CD, so it's it's a rescue shell for disk images. So you don't have to have an ISO or stuff. You just do it right away with guest fish install. Um, anything else? Okay, um, thank you very much.